Zoom these days. Um, so I want to uh, encourage you for the moment to mute your microphone if you have not already uh, done so. And um, we will have time for questions for sure. And um, I, I want to say that this is sort of a, a um, I don't know, an insider view of some of the experiences that I have had. Now, if I was doing the long version of this, I think I would be uh, I would be showing you a little bit of a clip of life upon the wicked stage that uh, song uh, that comes from a musical uh, that was popular about seventy years ago. But uh, what I'm going to do is just sort of give you a, a sense of. Um, some of my experiences. And I start with this. I want to make sure that you can see my screen. Can you all see those pictures? I am sharing my screen and I just want to, can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see the picture? Thank you very much. That's great. I know you're muted. So this is really, uh, as I like to say, how it started. I was a very shy child. I swear it's true. Um, and so, um, as I like to say, I uh, did the only thing that uh, you would do in response to being shy, which was I decided to go into the theater. Um, this is a picture of me in um, my uh, undergraduate college a cappella group, uh, the Sagettes. This is me right here, if you can see my cursor moving back and forth. Um, I did theater in college and uh, continued. These are a couple of shots of me a long time ago in The Sound of Music, and then a shot on the other side of the screen with my finger pointing uh, was when I was directing a production and I was talking to the uh, lighting director uh, at a tech rehearsal because they had blown about three light cues in, uh, one after another. And I was really trying to get them to understand that that wasn't what we wanted. Um, so that was the way uh, things went uh, for a while. Well, uh, I left New Haven, which was my home, and I, um, I went to Emerson College for my graduate studies. Um, these are some of my headshots from uh, theater. Um, and uh, I actually had a graduate assistantship in costume design. Um, I like to say that I can't draw my way out of a paper bag, but uh, I was doing some costume design work. And it was uh, actually through uh, my work in the design shop that I got to meet uh, a number of people who had connections. And uh, they started me uh, working in the um, uh, theater scene in Boston. Um, and it was, it was there that I met uh, several people who were terrific professors at Emerson. One of them was a guy who started his career with the Living Theater and La Mama Ensemble. He was... Uh, he was a professor who wanted to be friendly. He kept saying, let's go take a sauna and take our clothes off. And I kept saying, no, I don't really think so. Well, one connection did lead to another and I got a job offer for my first uh, job in professional theater. It was helping audition actors for a musical with a particular focus. Yes, it was Let My People Come, which was a nude musical. And my job was to talk to the actors after they had done their singing or their audition and to take them over to the side and they would take their clothes off and I would take a Polaroid picture of them. Yep, I never told my parents about it, but that was my very first job in theater. Um, 
things got a little more interesting. My second job in theater was working for the producer of something that was called the American Bicentennial Theater Series, which played at the Colonial Theater um, in Boston in 1976. And here you see the playbill for The Skin of Our Teeth. Elizabeth Ashley, who some of you I suspect may know, um, was cast as Sabina, the maid in that production. Um, the producer of that series told me right before the cast uh, arrived for rehearsals that he wanted me to go out and get some coke for Elizabeth Ashley. And I said innocently, okay, do you think she likes bottles or cans? And he looked at me and said, no, you fool, not that kind of coke. And he told me that I was supposed to go find the local drug dealer who was working in the theater district in Boston. I thought about it for a minute and I said, Norman, I really don't know enough to go do that. I think you're gonna have to ask somebody else. So you can see that these things were quite an education. My next job after that was moving on um, to a production at the uh, Wilbur Theater, actually, and I was hired to work on the national tour of um, an amazing play called Equus, uh, written by Peter Schaffer. You see a production photo here. Um, Brian Bedford, a uh, wonderful actor, now deceased, played the psychiatrist in that production, and a uh, very talented young man named Di Bradley uh, played the boy. Um, in the, in the show. It was a great experience to work on that. Uh, it ran uh, in Boston for uh, quite a long time and I was offered the opportunity to go on tour as an assistant stage manager, but I had not finished my degree. So I decided to stay. Um, and I then worked with Julie Harris um, and Charles Nelson Riley when they brought in The Bell of Amherst, which was a pre-Broadway tryout for that production. That was a lot of fun. After I graduated from Emerson the summer that I uh, got my master's degree, um, I worked at the Loeb Drama Center, which is now the home of the American Repertory Theater. And one of the productions was The Devil's Disciple, which was done with John Glover, a uh, very talented uh, actor. And it was great fun to do uh, those summer theater productions. Um, I kept saying I was gonna go to New York uh, because that's where you go if you work in theater, but the problem was I hated New York. I kept saying I was gonna go, I would go, I would visit my friends and I would come home and say, I hate New York, what a, I, you know, I can't do it. So I realized that what I did really love was regional theater. And I decided that that was what I was going to do. My uh, first stop uh, after my degree was at the Hartford Stage Company uh, in 1976, where I worked with Paul Widener, the artistic director. And on the right on the screen, you can see David Skull, who became a horror writer and critic and cultural commentator. Um, there were some wonderful productions there, but I pretty quickly went to the Hartman Theater Company in Stamford, Connecticut, which was so named for Margot Hartman Tenney. She was an heiress and an actress in the horror film, The Curse of the Living Corpse. I am not making this up. Uh, at, that is Marco's body in one of the still shots from uh, that drama. And uh, there definitely were adventures at that theater company. Um, you can see here Del Tenney uh, on the upper left in your screen um, was the producer of the company there with uh, Margot, uh, the next picture, picture over to the right. I also worked with a, a real character, this guy with the long hair, whose name was Steve Rothman, who uh, did a benefit show at the Hartman with Helen Hayes, the famous actress 
and threw his arm around her and said, Helen, stick with me and I'll take you straight to the top. <laughs> she, she didn't kick him in the shin for that. Uh, she was quite gracious. Uh, the guy on the right is Roger Meeker, who did a great deal of lighting design for um, the Williamstown Theater Festival. And these were the people I worked with. I also worked with Shirley Jean Measures, who had been one of the original Little Rascals and then became a burlesque artist. And um, after she left burlesque, uh, she worked in theater in group sales uh, for the Hartman Theater Company. Uh, one of my uh, most interesting experiences was working with Kate Mulgrew, who was perhaps best known as first female commander of the Starship Enterprise uh, in a production of Othello, uh, Shakespeare's Othello. You see her here in a, a promotional photo with Ron O'Neill, who had been the uh, star of the cult film Superfly. Uh, playing that role. And I got to meet a number of famous theater critics, including Clive Barnes, who had worked for the New York Times and later the New York Post. Um, I used to have to drive into New York to pick up critics and bring them out to Stamford. Um, and uh, sometimes we sent a limo in, and I would ride in in the limo and pick the critic up and then bring them back out. And um, one of those times, the ride became quite interesting because Clive decided he was going to be my new best friend. So I ended up sort of fighting him off in the back seat of the limo. Not what I had expected. Um, one of the best uh, experiences at the Hartman Theater Company was working on a production called As to the Meaning of Words. Um, which was covered by the New York Times. Uh, you may remember that there was a very famous uh, abortion rights case that came up in the 1970s, if your memory goes back that far, involving a doctor named Kenneth Edelman. And um, this was made into a drama which was premiered at the Hartman Theater Company. The actor Earl Hyman, whose picture you see here, was uh, the star of that drama, and it was a wonderful experience. We also produced a benefit concert with Judy Collins. And you see her photograph here. Um, it was a, a great time to be working. Um, but I uh, was invited to join the staff of the Yale Repertory Theater next, and I went back to New Haven and was privileged to be able to work with Lloyd Richards, who had been the first black director to work on Broadway when he had staged A Raisin in the Sun um, by the playwright uh, Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, and Lloyd was an amazing artist and came to Yale after Bart Giamatti had had a falling out with Robert Brewstein, who took all the records and all the materials of Yale Rep and took them to uh, Harvard to start the ART. Uh, so I came in with, uh, with Lloyd's team and went to work. And Lloyd began connecting with playwrights, uh, producing important works with social messaging. And one of the first ones was the playwright Athel Fugard, who you see here on the left. Um, on the right is a shot of him uh, on stage with Zake Smokai, uh, his very, very close associate and fellow actor uh, in one of the productions, The Blood Knot. Um, we went on to do a lot of Fugard's work, and it was all uh, remarkable. Uh, Master Harold and the Boys uh, was premiered there, um, and uh, many other works as well. Uh, and I spent a lot of time sitting in a bar with Atho Fugard, and uh, it was amazing. Um, those works also brought James Earl Jones to the Yale Rep, and 
he was in residence at Yale Rep for two years. Um, and uh, part of my job was to kind of, you know, companion him uh, through some of the productions uh, that he worked on. He was a wonderful man um, and in general, a very uh, generous person. Um, these are some images of him uh, performing in the world premiere of A Lesson from Aloes, which made its premiere at Yale Rep uh, and then moved to Broadway. Um, some of the people who I worked with at Yale have gone on to have remarkable careers, and some of them are uh, shown here. Um, Angela Bassett. David Allen Greer, John Turturro, Courtney Vance, David Strathairn and Francis McDormand, and Jane Kaczmarek. And those are just a few of the people who were students at the Yale School of Drama at the time that I was there. Um, and these were all actors. Um, there were also remarkable playwrights and uh, theater managers who studied at Yale. Um, and they include uh, a couple of the people pictured here, Alex Witchell, who writes for the New York Times, and Susan Solt, who is at UC Santa Cruz. Um, documenting the productions, I know that I'm at about 15 minutes, I will just say, and I'll take just a couple of minutes more and then I'll pause for your questions. Documenting the productions was essential. I was fortunate to work with Jerry Goodstein, who, uh, as uh, you can see, took this iconic shot, which I suspect many of you have seen of Donna McKechnie in a chorus line. Um, Jerry has become a good friend and I am still in contact with him. Among the playwrights that came to Yale uh, after that first year were August Wilson. And August Wilson uh, premiered a number of his uh, works at Yale and Lloyd Richards worked on those. And here you see on the right a shot of James Earl Jones in the original production of Fences. And also images here of the piano lesson and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Um, I will just quickly show you a couple more images from that time. Uh, these are all images of James Earl Jones in uh, Fences in A Lesson from Aloes, in uh, Timon of Athens, uh, and in Hedda Gabler with Diane Wiest. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is that Yale staged the US premiere of other works. And this was an attempt at flying by the Bulgarian playwright Jordan Rudichkov. It was about a group of uh, men who see a barrage balloon flying over the countryside and they grab it and then go up in the balloon to have an adventure which really shows them something about freedom for the first time. The image that you see on your screen, I'm, I'm over here sitting on one of the balloon seats. Uh, we took this as a company photo. Um, it really captures that spirit of adventure that was part of um, my time at Yale Rep. Um, I, I will say that uh, I will hold dear those experiences with Lloyd Richards forever. Um, I left Yale Rep after uh, several years and went to become the director of cultural affairs at the city of New Haven's um, uh, administrative offices. And I worked with uh, Mayor Biagio Delito uh, on establishing uh, a sort of cultural awareness in New Haven. Uh, I got to ride on an elephant, which damn near killed me. Uh, I also had a radio show while I was there uh, interviewing various people. I brought uh, various uh, cultural elements to uh, the city of New Haven. Um, 
uh, which were wonderful. And we reopened the Schubert Theater. Uh, we had a huge star-studded production to do that, the Schubert being where lots of Broadway shows tried out. Uh, and we started the New Haven Jazz Festival with major jazz performers, which all these years later is still going and is one of the top uh, outdoor music events uh, in the country. Um, it was after that time that I left to join uh, the Unitarian Universalist Association uh, and the staff uh, when Bill Schultz and Kay Montgomery reached out to me to do that. And there are more stories there, but that is for another day for sure. So uh, with thanks to you for um, listening to my fast tour, uh, through life in the theater and the arts, I'm very happy to answer your questions or respond to your comments. Thank you, Debbie. So we are going to do, if you have any questions or comments, Debbie, please uh, raise your hand in the, um, in the participants uh, um, emoji or list. Uh, you will see the raise your hand um, so we have a question. You bet. Judy. Judy Cole, yes, would you like hi. to? Yes. Hi. Hi, Debbie. Hello. I want to just say this was so enjoyable. Oh, thank you. And compliment you on how the graphics just flowed along. And they seem to, they seem to fit the screen perfectly. And they were also clear. And, and fascinating with all the different photography and graphics with the with the playbills and everything. So it was terrific. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Elizabeth, you have a question. Uh, you mentioned that when you were at the Yale Repertory Theater, there was a period of time where I'm assuming you said one of the members, the lead members, took all of the materials and went to lead and start another repertory theater. Um, uh -huh. What was involved in starting from scratch? You said I, we just went from there. What was involved in that? Thanks for asking that question, because indeed, that was a time. Um, yes, it was Robert Brewstein who, and, and his, his group of people, which included Jan Geit. Uh, who had been doing promotions and marketing, um, and they literally took everything. I mean everything. Um, well, it was just like starting a new theater company. I mean, honestly, that was, that was kind of the way it had to be. Yeah, we just, I mean, I remember arriving and opening file drawers, and there was like nothing there. And I went, walked down the street to Lloyd's office, and I walked in and I said, well, there's nothing here. And he said, well, I guess we're going to start from scratch. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, what could you do? I mean, it was, I, I have to say, this is, this is, um, I was, I was going to say that this is, uh, cheap of me. This is small of me. Um, I, I have held something of a grudge against Robert Brewstein all these years, uh, which I should not do. That is not noble of me to say that. But I, I just felt like it was so rotten of them to have done that. But of course, they were furious with Bart Giamatti. So, I mean, that was their revenge. Uh, Ruth Rose, you're next. Ruth? Yes, sorry, sorry. I'm no actually problem. ceding a small amount of time to David Rose. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think you know enough, uh, know me well enough to know that I like mostly the dirty gossip. And <laughs> I, I was an undergrad yes. uh, when Bruce Dean's whole entourage came up to Cambridge. And of course, it was the best thing ever because Harvard had nothing. And I always wondered what the fight was about with Jim. What happened in uh, between Giamatti and Brewstein? I, 
honest to God, I don't know. Um, I, I, I know, I know a little bit. I know that uh, Giamatti, I, I got to know Bart Giamatti a little, a little bit. Um, I know that there was a feeling that it was too much, there was too much experimental avant-garde theater and that uh, Giamatti wanted something that had a little more um, solid uh, presentation of a stab, not, ju not just established works, but major playwrights uh, who would uh, carry forward a message that had more to do with where we wanted to be in the world and and not only avant-garde. So there was some of that, and I think there really was the feeling that it had become kind of like the Brewstein cult. So that's that's a little bit about it, I guess. Uh, Don. Yeah, thanks, Deb. That was fabulous. Um, I could ask you a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> Limit myself to one and a half connected questions. All right. The question is, do you miss that life? And can you imagine ever going back to it? Yeah, right. Um, you know, I'll tell you something. I have, honest to God, I have up in the attic in a garment bag, I have this gorgeous silk taffeta gown that I wore at the uh, reopening of the Schubert Theater. And in my, in my closet, I have the shoes that matched. I mean, it was gorgeous. And I have a couple of your evening dresses like up there. They would be now like vintage things. And every so often I sigh and I think, you know, I had this sort of glamorous life. Um, but then I remember that I married the guy that I love and that I have this wonderful life now. And uh, that's worth uh, much more to me. Um, and I know that sounds smarmy, but it's true. Um, there is a connection between theater and religion. I just have to say that. I mean, it's those two things are not totally disconnected and it's not just about the arts and letters. There are some similarities and transferable things. Um, but the other thing, Don, truly is that, I, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, you're a playwright. It's an abusive life. It's really, hard and it can just be a, the worst meat grinder in the world and it can eat you and um i i used to and i still do sometimes talk to people who want to go into the, the arts as a career and i keep i i talk about it like we talk about ministry that it's a calling and one of the things i say to them is do not do this unless it is truly the only thing you can imagine doing with your life because otherwise it will just eat you alive. And I believe that. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have David. Dave, Dave, yes, please. Are you, un can you unmute Dave? There we go. There you go. Deb. Yeah. Uh, the very big opening of your uh, beginning of your talk, you talked about the how you were sort of transformed by by acting and what that did for you. I immediately harked back to the days. I, I never was bitten by the acting bug, although uh, I certainly enjoy plays and and value them or whatever. But I was thinking of of the the, the a second grade class that I taught at Esterbrook a thousand years ago, and I was in those days I was influenced by. Violet Spolin, Improvisation for the Theater. It was a book. Yeah. I used that, and I used that with, with uh, to do things with students who, who love doing that. But what I, I can think of two examples. One was with a, that second grade class, and another with a fifth grade class I wasn't teaching, where uh, there was a, particularly a boy in that second grade class who was painfully, painfully shy 
and also going through some, his mother was also very ill and died not long after that. So he had a lot going on with him. But you literally put a paper bag over his head and can turn it into a mask. Yeah. And he was released. It was like, yeah, there was a new person there. It was just. Yeah, it's interesting, it so isn't remarkable. it? Right. One of, one of my um, one of my professors at Emerson, this was, I mean, I remember it well, standard stage diction was the class and we had to do speeches. It, there was a lot of Shakespeare going on and he was not liking, he, he was after me because I had too much hand movement, and body movement and not enough voice. And so I remember this was a speech from Richard III. He made me get in a trash can and do the speech in the trash can down in it because he wanted the characterization to come out through my voice. And uh, it's interesting how when you put a mask on or you do these things, you know, different stuff can come out. Don, you're back. Or, okay, or Helen. Yes, Helen. Um, first of all, it's wonderful to see the early pictures of you. And <laughs> Abigail looks so much like you. I just can't, can't believe it. Yeah. That's right. really nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks. And Thank I, I mean, it was fascinating, the different parts of it. But um, what was what was James Earl Jones like? I mean, I bet he's somebody that you know I admire tremendously, and so I, you know, I yeah. think it must have been wonderful to have that experience. So he was wonderful. I mean, he uh, he is in so many ways a very generous man. Um, he, you may know that he. Uh, is or was a stutterer and he he has worked very i mean you think about it it's one of the world's greatest voices and he has worked so hard um to cultivate that voice and um i remember being with him when he had agreed to do a voiceover uh for i don't know it's some ad or something but i i was with him and he was exhausted because we'd been rehearsing a show and you could see the stuttering coming out and he had to really work at it. Um, he, he was great fun. I will say that one of the stories I left out was that I was doing promotion and marketing and I had arranged for him to go to a private school in New Haven to do a thing with the kids, you know, an assembly in the, in the school auditorium, and there were like 500 kids. So I went to the apartment where he was staying to pick him up in the morning. And I went up to the door and knocked on the door and he came to the door and he said, I don't want to go. I'm tired. I don't want to go. And I said, oh, come on. And he, he was pretty ornery and he got you know, annoyed. And he said, no, I'm not going. And I thought to myself, what the hell am I going to do? And I finally got really pissed off at him. And I said, listen, damn it, there are 500 kids sitting in an auditorium right now, and they are waiting for you to show up and you are going to do it because it is not fair to those kids to not show up. Now get in the car. And Afterwards, I thought, oh, my God, what did I just do? He got in the car, and we went. And I thought, oh, God. You know, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to get fired. This is going to be terrible. But da -da. Nope, he was good. And he was fabulous with the kids. That was one of the very few times when I ever saw that kind of attitude coming out. I mean, mostly he was a real gentle man and it was a real privilege to work with them all right elizabeth yes you shared now a few stories of your interactions with actors yeah. um some of them uh referring to uh wanting to be your best friend 
And now here is one that's referring to basically you needing to show authority in that position. Uh, would you be willing to say a little bit about what it was like to be a woman in, in, in it sounds like a repertory or an experience where all your bosses were men and all yeah. the people you were reporting to or in charge were, were men? And yeah. do you think that's changed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you've asked the question. Um, well, so I said a little bit about this. You know, I... I told you that I got jumped in the back of a limousine um, by Clive Barnes. Um, it, was, <clears throat> it was a pretty uh, tough environment. Um, my, first, uh, my first job at Hartford Stage, uh, I overheard the managing director uh, of the company saying in a really nasty way after I'd been there about a month, I, I don't want to have any dumb little girls working for me. And he was referring to me. And I really was offended by that. Um, you know, I will also say that at Hartford Stage, um, they made it clear to me uh, that they wanted me dressed nicely, preferably in a low cut dress on the night when the critics were there to um, soften up uh, Malcolm Johnson, the critic for the Hartford State, for the Hartford Current at the time. And that was like really common. I mean, I was always being told to dress in certain ways and you know, wear, wear particular kinds of clothes and, you know, makeup and, you know, play it up and that kind of stuff. And, and of course, the, the reality is, I mean, I, I did some of that. And it was, that was just kind of the way it was uh, at that time. And, but I got, I got more and more frustrated with it. Um, it was, uh, it was a tough, uh, atmosphere, I would say for young women and, and you really had to be able to kind of persevere through that. And there was uh, the behavior then, you know, you could see how it led to the Me Too movement, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's just some of the stuff that went on was just outrageous uh, as I look back on it. So yeah, it was a different time. Well, thank you, Debbie. It's already 5.10. Yes, right, we've gone over. Well, you've all been really, really nice to hang in there and it's been um, just delightful presenting this. Thank you and, um, you know, if you have any other questions that uh, you you want me to respond to. I am more than happy to do that. It's really a pleasure to be with you. I wish I got to see you all more, um, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.